a personal part of the story was told to me by my friend's older brother Jay and his mom. The rest is common knowledge around my hometown. When Jay was about 10 years old in 1992, an ice cream truck started driving around town. It was in the middle of summer, and the truck stopped at all the lakes and parks in their town. Nobody really thought much of it, because their town was small and rural. Of course, they'd have a local ice cream truck. Being 10, Jay was excited whenever he heard the ice cream truck drive around. That is, he was excited until he convinced his mom to give him some money and let him buy an ice cream from the truck. He sprinted to the truck with excitement, which had stopped about a block from his house. He got a very funny feeling from the guy driving it. He was one quarter Native American, and his mom was a full half and was an actual medicine woman. The whole family believed heavily in trusting their intuitions. When Jay got that weird feeling about the driver, he simply backed away and went home. Even though there was a group of three or four boys at the truck already, he told his mom about his inexplicable feeling of unease when he saw the man at the driver's seat. And his mom told him to stay away if it didn't feel right. A couple of weeks later, two boys went missing while they were out at a park. Their moms had turned their backs for less than a minute. At first, it was assumed that they went exploring in the nearby creeks, looking for salamanders. But after hours of searching, it came out that the last vehicle seen in the area was that very same ice cream truck. The truck then stopped showing up for multiple days, prompting the police to ask the town officials about the ice cream man. It turned out that nobody knew the guy. He didn't fill out the proper paperwork or get a license, nor did he do whatever it is you have to do to drive an ice cream truck. Nobody thought anything of it because the guy had so confidently shown up and seamlessly started driving his route. I guess he had scouted out the local beforehand in another car, or perhaps on foot, and picked out all the areas kids like to hang out at. The driver couldn't contain himself for long, though. He started driving his truck around the shadiest parts of the town, trailer parks, and the like. A week after the boys went missing, this trailer park was literally on the wrong side of the tracks with a railroad running right down the side. The town dump was just a little farther down the street. It was at the very edge of town with nothing else around it but empty woods. I forgot to mention that the town is in rural Michigan. So the trailer park was about a mile deep into the woods. The cops were called and told that the guy seemed to be living in that trailer park found his truck with a tarp haphazardly thrown over it and burst into the nearby trailer and arrested him. This is where local legend starts taking over. I don't really know what they found inside the trailer. I've heard the trailer was filled with memorabilia from past children. I've also heard it was just a shitty trailer that looked like a hobo with a roofing plastic fetish lived there. I do know that the guy ended up confessing after the police found some evidence in his trailer, telling them that he had kidnapped, murdered, and dumped the two boys' bodies at the dump just down the street. It was the grisliest thing to happen in that town's history. A few years later, when I was growing up, things were much more strict. There were cameras at all the parks now, and an organized neighborhood watch program. A see something, say something, law was also enacted. Once smartphones became popular, I downloaded the Offender Database app and set it to my hometown. It seems my hometown is Offender Central. There are dozens of them living in the downtown area, maybe 10 blocks by 10 blocks, and over three dozen within the boundaries of my school district. One lived less than a mile away from me on some dark wooded road. So this happened when I was 11 years old. 
My parents and I had just moved from one state to another in the USA. We had just finished unpacking all our stuff, and I was about to start my first day at a new school in the third state in four years. I was already nervous and didn't want to go to school, but my parents insisted I go so I could make friends. Since we had just moved there, my dad was working, but not my mom at the time. She stood with me outside the house, waiting for the bus to come early in the morning. On this morning, there happened to be a really tattered looking minivan parked right across the street from our house. Its windows were covered in duct tape and cardboard, and it was streaked with mud and dirt. The driver of the van was staring us down through the window. My mom was about to open the door to let the dog out. But at that moment, the man in the minivan opened his door too, looking like he was getting ready to sprint from it when she closed the door. He did the same once more when she tried to open the door and he copied her again. She closed it in a hurry, and the man looked very frustrated as he closed his door once more. My mom went and grabbed the phone and started dialing the police. Once the guy saw her with the phone in hand, he sped off right away. She gave a description of the guy and his van, including the license plate number. Later, we found out he was arrested for carrying an unregistered pistol. He had a couple of rolls of duct tape, a baseball bat, and several knives as well. There was also a package of huge black garbage bags inside his van. I'm not sure exactly how things would have ended if my mom had fully opened the door, but I think I have a pretty good idea. In the words of a sage YouTuber called Marc Applier, the ocean, he was absolutely right. I'll never go to the ocean again. The beach, okay, sure, but going in the water, no way. I never thought I'd get out of it to tell this story, so I want to tell you why. Now that I have, I live just off the coast of Maine, USA, in a part of the coastline that's more rock and fishing wares than beaches and hotels. The ocean there is gray and rough, waves smashing away at the shore and pieces breaking off at times with a violent sound like thunder. Boats get rocked back and forth in the local harbor, like ducks in the water daily, and things never seem to calm down, even on sunnier days. As such, I stayed far away from the water. When it was stormy, you could feel little sprays of it on the wind, and the salt seemed to clog your nostrils until you got inside. When my daughter begged me to go watch one particular storm with her though, I found it quite difficult to say no. She was eight at the time and very interested in the weather. She'd even gotten one of those weather kits for her birthday a few months back. And as her father, I really wanted to encourage that curiosity. Some of you might call me an idiot, but we were going to stay on high ground and in the car at all times, just in case. The storm was said to be one for the record books. 50 miles per hour, winds and waves just as tall, supposedly. The Weather Channel said there was expected to be some flooding and cautioned all boat owners to storm-proof their vessels and under no circumstances to go out on the water that day. Sounded reasonable to me. We headed out around mid-afternoon, already Storefronts were shuttered and reinforced in town, and the boats were grounded, clumped together in the harbor. Homes around us had also been reinforced, and some people were even packing their cars to head to a safe spot to weather out the storm for a day or two, just in case. We probably should have taken that initiative too, in retrospect but I had no way of knowing what our little storm chasing trip would result in. Above the harbor, on a cliffside road, there was a little viewing area where one or two cars could park and basically overlook the sea on any given day. I thought this was a perfect and safe way of viewing the storm. When we parked, I also let my daughter go up to the railing 
and seat herself between the rungs. I stood beside her, holding on to her hand and wanting to savor the moment. Dark clouds rolled over the churning water, and my daughter was enthralled when chains of lightning started to flash over the horizon. She kept telling me to look and had the biggest grin an eight-year-old could ever possibly have. My heart warmed up seeing her happy, even though I was shivering in the strong winds and hunkering down in my jacket. I wished I had brought a thermos of hot coffee or soup to tide me over, but there was nothing I could do about it now. My daughter passed the time by, telling me about the different clouds and weather reactions she could see out there. And I wondered with her about what the fish under the waves felt, if anything, as the water tossed around like dirty bedsheets. I guess they were probably used to it, but my daughter wasn't so sure. She said she hoped all the fishes were okay out there. I laughed and looked out at the waves. That's when we both saw something that made our stomachs churn, or at least mine did. There was a small motorboat just bobbing up and down on the waves, away from the harbor. It really should have been anchored. It seemed to barely keep up with the massive waves. At one point, a wall of water nearly crested over top of them. What the hell were these people doing? Did they get lost? Did they lose track of time? Were they not local? And hadn't heard the storm warning for the day on the news? Maybe. But even with all those excuses, there was no escaping the dire situation occurring in front of us. A group of people were going to drown right in front of me and my daughter and we couldn't do anything about it. No, this was at the time before cell phones, but I don't think making a call would have made much of a difference in these conditions anyway. My daughter looked worried and asked if they were going to make it. I felt my heart cracking too when the boat made its first nosedive under the water. My daughter cuddled close and clutched my arm as if trying to keep from getting tossed in her own storm. No matter how fast she was growing up, she was still a kid. And you're not supposed to see something like this when you're a child. I shielded her eyes. She tried to peek out from between my fingers a few times, but I told her not to. Don't look, it'll be okay. They'll make it. They were all lies I regret telling but I didn't know what else to do at that moment. The boat had no control anymore. It veered sideways underneath a crushing wave just as it crashed against a rock that jutted out. That did it. Even from that far away, it looked as if the boat popped in half without any carnage. But I could picture the splintering, the people inside with their bones being crushed against the rock all the blood that would probably float on top of the water. I shuddered just holding my daughter. I tried to convince her and myself that everything was fine. It was just an empty boat swept out of the dock to the sea by the tide, but I knew better. The boat was driving evasively through the waves, and that meant there was at least one person inside controlling it, and that person had just died. Needless to say, my daughter and myself needed a lot of counseling to move past that event. She's doing much better now, but I don't know if I could say the same for myself. 21 and female. I don't know exactly how long this will be. It took me about four days to be able to actually type this out. I got weird many anxiety attacks when I tried. I'll be the first to admit I have had a very can't happen to me sort of complex, and that's kind of what occurred in this story. I'm a university student and live in a rental house with five other people. It's far from ideal, but in this housing outcry that we're living in, it takes that sting off of having to pay a bunch of money a month just to exist in a little box. This does have relevancy, I swear. I got extremely lucky last weekend 
when the five other roommates I had were all out for the weekend. This had never happened before, so I was ecstatic to have the house all to myself. I did the whole 21-year-old girl home alone stuff you can think of, watching movies with the volume up loud, taking long-ass showers, walking around the house without a bra, etc. It was around 10 p.m. I had finished some homework and was relaxing with a glass of wine and watching some streaming services. It sounded briefly like there was something moving on the porch outside. We've had a fox in our yard before, and the thing used to make a lot of noise out there, so I assumed it must just be back now or something. After hearing some fumbling the second time, I went over to check through the window. I couldn't see anything out there. As I'm turning to head back into the living room, a piece of cement suddenly flew through our kitchen window. I think I peed myself a little bit when that happened. I definitely screamed like a little girl. My moronic ass started unlocking the door to go outside and check things out, but common sense took control of me again, and I locked the door once more. I also ran into the back door to make sure it was still locked, even though it's glass and wouldn't make much of a difference. Oddly enough, at this time, my grandma's words came into my head until I looked down and there was a man sitting in my car. I had never seen this man before. He looked at me for a moment and I felt a chill run down my spine. My parents noticed the change in my tone and asked what was wrong. In a hushed voice, I told them there was a stranger in my car. I quickly hung up and took a step back, my mind racing. The man in the car continued to stare at me. I could see confusion and maybe a hint of guilt in his eyes. I asked him, what the hell are you doing in my car? He stammered for a moment before claiming he thought it was his friend's car. It made no sense, and I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Summoning courage, I told the man to get out of the car immediately. He complied, stumbling out and mumbling apologies. I noticed his hands were shaking as he raised them in a gesture of surrender. I didn't want to confront him further, so I backed away and called the police. As I waited for the police to arrive, the man stood awkwardly in my driveway. He attempted to explain himself, but his words were disjointed and didn't add up. When the police arrived, they questioned him and then turned their attention to me for my account of the situation. The man didn't pose an immediate threat, so they let him go with a warning. I felt a mix of relief and frustration. How could someone invade my personal space like that and face no consequences? The police advised me to be vigilant and lock my doors, but there wasn't much more they could do. The incident left me on edge for days. I installed additional security measures, including motion-activated lights and cameras around my property. It was unsettling to think that someone could just wander into my car without any apparent motive. I kept the incident to myself, not wanting to worry my family or friends unnecessarily. In the following weeks, I became more cautious, always checking my surroundings before entering my car or home. The dogs, usually friendly, seemed more alert and protective. The unnerving experience lingered in my mind, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the man in my car had left an invisible mark on my sense of security. Life moved on, and I gradually eased back into my routine, but the memory of that unsettling encounter remained etched in my mind. I became more appreciative of the safety that comes with having people around, and the incident served as a stark reminder of the vulnerability we sometimes feel when alone, even in the supposed safety of our own homes. Before asking where Dan and Isaac are, I didn't know either of those people, and I told 
told him so. I could see he had all the personal items from the car in his lap. I started telling him he needed to get out and leave. Then I saw pepper spray in his hands, which had been left behind by my friend. I knew in that moment that my day was about to end with being pepper sprayed, so I told my parents to call the cops. He stepped out of the car, asking where the ice was. I told him he had the wrong place and grabbed the CD case out of his hands. He reached for the pepper spray and I backed up. He eyed me for a moment before saying, I'll be back, bro. Just you watch. I watched him walk off, and for a brief moment, he started yelling at a tree down the street. The cops came, and he was found up the road, but the officers could not find the rest of my stuff. That experience definitely freaked me out for the rest of the day. This took place in my hometown of Weymouth when I was 14 years old. My friends and I decided to go exploring in an abandoned building right next to some railroad tracks. We figured we could sneak into a loading bay that faced the tracks. Our plan was to sneak out at 11 p.m., get out of there by 11.30, and try to be back home by one o'clock. I will admit that I was scared in the days leading up to it. It was basically unheard of in my town for anyone to do anything remotely risky but we were young and reckless, and we wanted some real excitement and adventure. The night came, and Tim and Charlie were supposed to meet me by a streetlight near a cafe. Then we would find the tracks and follow them for about a quarter mile until we arrived at the loading bay. I grabbed a couple of flashlights and headed out once my family finally fell asleep. As I was walking down to the cafe though, I heard footsteps approaching quickly from behind me. When I turned around, I was surprised to find no one was there. I ignored it, thinking that my mind was playing tricks on me. I was already anxious after all. After about five minutes though, it happened again. I turned around in a snap, only to find that nobody was there. I finally got to the cafe where we were supposed to meet up. My friends, Tim and Charlie, were already there, so we proceeded with our plan. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I wasn't about to let my friends know I was scared. We finally reached the abandoned building. One of the old, rusty bay doors was jammed open, just enough for us to slide underneath it. We entered the building and turned on our flashlights. There was graffiti everywhere and it was obvious we weren't the only ones who came in here looking for thrills. There was one piece of graffiti that really caught my eye. It was metallic paint that stood out from the rest. It read, don't come back. Hey guys, come check this out, I called out to my friends. I was answered by manic footsteps pounding right behind me. I turned back to check what was going on, only to see a tall, skinny man with greasy, wiry hair. He wore, until my friends started screaming at me to run. That brought me back to reality. I booked it. As I was approaching the bay door, I heard the man's footsteps right behind me. They were getting louder, and he was closing in quickly. I slid right through the door like a baseball player would. I scrambled to my feet and almost fell over. We made a break for it. The thing that sticks with me even to this day, the thing that really chills me to the bone, was the voice that boomed out from the building after us. A slow, drawling call that only made us run even faster. What the hell was that? Tim panted as we ran. I don't know, I said. Charlie was so shaken up, he couldn't even say a single word. When we got back to the cafe, we decided we would all go back to our houses. But there was one thought that kept me up for the rest of the night. One thought that still haunts me to this day. Those footsteps that I'd heard earlier that night. Was that him? How long had he been following me? I guess I'll never know. I'm a woman and a freshman in college 
attending a local university in my area. I decided to live on campus to get the full college experience. I didn't want to miss out on the fun opportunities my college had to offer. Starting in a new school already made me nervous, but the idea of being all on my own in college made it all the more scary. I've never not had anyone before, being a twin and all. I've had a built-in best friend pretty much my whole life. My twin, however, went to a different college and I was all alone. The semester started off like I'd anticipated. My classes were full of quiet and similarly anxious kids like myself, who also didn't really know what to expect. There was this one kid in my morning history class though, who really put me off. He always wore this extremely dirty baseball cap, cargo pants, and a tattered long t-shirt. He had a chubby face, but wasn't that overweight. At the same time, he wasn't really fit either, if you know what I mean. He had narrow glasses and talked endlessly about the most random things to anyone and everyone. He exhibited some very strange behaviors, but I didn't really think too much about him. He sat pretty far away from me, and I didn't think he would ever have the opportunity to bother me. That was until the next class came. Our history class had finished up, and I was packing my stuff up to leave. I hadn't noticed this strange guy wandering over to my desk. That is, was until I looked upward and saw him just silently hovering over me. I put on a weak smile, waited for him to say something to me. Hi, I'm Connor, he said in a quietly monotone voice. It was so quiet, I almost couldn't hear what he was saying. Hi, nice to meet you, Connor, I responded. I didn't say anything else. I thought it was a bit of a weird introduction, but again, it seemed harmless. That was until our next history class together. Everything went well during the class itself. I felt fine, and Connor was minding his own business in his seat far away from me. As class was dismissed, and everyone was packing up their belongings to leave, once more, I was the last one out. I had to put many things, as well as my reading glasses, away into my backpack. When I looked up at the door, Connor was there in the doorway, waiting for me. He didn't exactly say anything. He just stood at the door, watching me. I was very confused, as we'd never talked before. He was just standing there giving me this really unsettling look, watching me pack the rest of my things away. I slipped past him and walked out the door. He followed me and casually mentioned the tests we had taken that day, trying to brag to me, making it seem like he was above me in a way. I got a 91 on the test today, no big deal. What about you, 85, I responded. It was so easy though. His response was very patronizing and he seemed to be really mocking me. I didn't like it one bit. People who brag like that always tend to make me mad and he seemed like one of those types of people. At some point down the stairs, it was a long way down because we were on the fourth floor. He started talking about sweatpants for some reason. He was mumbling so much that I couldn't even really hear what he was saying. To be honest, I just wanted to get away from him. I looked back, only to find him slapping me in the face with a condom. I think you know what I'm talking about, Connor randomly said while giving me a creepy smile. I awkwardly nodded my head, trying to stay collected as we reached the bottom of the stairs. Whatever he'd been mumbling couldn't have been anything good or anything I wanted to talk about with him. I kept to myself, trying to get the hell away from this guy. I hadn't felt that uncomfortable in a while. Something about him was just very off-putting. I'm not a very confrontational person, and I hate to upset anyone in general. Connor asked me at one point to a homecoming dance that was being facilitated by a student organization on campus. When I told him that I would be visiting my parents on the day the dance was supposed to take place, 
His response really unnerved me. Well, I guess it's not like I can stop you from visiting your parents, but who knows what might happen after that. I started exercising extreme caution around him. I didn't trust this guy, not one bit. That, it may seem obvious, but I'm telling you, you would not want to be alone in a dark alley with this guy. He was really giving off some Brock Turner type vibes. Some time passed by, and I found myself back in history class again, taking another test. He finished his test early and walked out of the classroom. I was a bit relieved, actually. I finished my test around an hour later. I looked up from my desk and checked my messages before exiting the classroom only to find that one of my friends in that class had texted me. Hey, Connor's waiting for you outside. My heart started to beat really fast. There was no way he would be waiting for me. It had been an entire hour since he'd left. I cautiously peeked around the door to look into the waiting area outside the room. And sure enough, Connor was right there just around the corner, waiting. At this point, I became really scared and confused. Why would he be waiting for me for so long? We were not friends, and I never even hinted at the idea that I would ever be interested in him. I tried to quietly sneak out of class, but sure enough, he followed after me down the stairs, talking about a whole bunch of weird, creepy stuff that I couldn't really make out because of his mumbling. Something else I'd been noticing was that he seemed to be moving closer and closer to my desk each class, turning around and staring at me constantly. It made me feel so uncomfortable. I would give him a stare that pretty much said, what the hell are you looking at? To show him that I saw what he was doing, but he didn't seem to care. After this, he started to always follow me around. I pretty much ran away every time. There was another incident where I was walking into the history building, and Connor was in mid-conversation with some other girl from our class. He immediately stopped talking to her mid-sentence and followed me into the classroom. The creepiest part about all of this is that it's still going on to this day. I only have two months left with him in my class for the semester. I've tried to raise the issue with the school's administration, and they told me that unless he directly touches me and hurts me, there's nothing they would be able to do. I don't know how much longer I can take this. I have to look over my shoulder every time I go to school. If things get worse, and he becomes more daring with his behavior, who knows what he would do next? Growing up, I lived in a heavily forested area. There's this now abandoned house that was in the woods behind my childhood home. The driveway connected to ours and broke off, circling around our garage and then going deeper into the trees. It was a single story house with a big, nice front porch and had an eerie atmosphere that sent shivers down my spine. Outdoor overhang instead of a full garage. When I was a kid, we had an elderly neighbor who lived back there named Mr. Fisher. He was a Vietnam vet who was partially blind in one eye. He normally wore glasses and an eye patch. On the rare occasions that we saw him outside, he kept to himself mostly. He never really had any visitors either. It was about 20 years ago back when I was in high school. I was home alone, playing on my Nintendo. I remember it was later in the day, and it was raining pretty hard. I was grounded for some reason I can't quite remember, and was bitterly sitting in my room, taking out my teenage frustrations on the game. That's when I heard screaming coming from behind my house. I paused my game and cracked open my window, listening in to make sure of what I was hearing. Every few moments, I heard faint screaming coming from Mr. Fisher's house, maybe 50 or so yards away from my own. 
I couldn't figure out if it was an angry scream or a terrified one. I remember sitting there for a few moments, more curious than alarmed, really. After a few minutes, I got bored and shut the window, returning to my video game. I don't know why I didn't call for help or run over and knock on Mr. Fisher's door to see if things were okay. My only explanation is that I was a bitter teenager and didn't want to be bothered with anything that wasn't my business. Later that night, after my parents came home, I was lying in bed when I once again heard the muffled screaming coming from behind the house. This time though, I could tell it was clearly labored and ragged. I can remember being annoyed, wishing that whoever it was would just shut up already. I didn't even mention it to my parents. The next morning, about a week goes by, and I had completely forgotten about the screaming I'd heard that night. I was outside throwing the football with my father when the mailman stopped his truck. He asked if any of us had seen Mr. Fisher. Apparently, he had not been collecting his mail for quite some time. My father replied that he hadn't seen his car for a few days either. I remained silent as the mailman and my father walked down the driveway and knocked on Mr. Fisher's door. The next thing I remember were all the sirens. An ambulance, a fire engine, multiple police cars arrived. I spent most of that afternoon up in a tree, watching Mr. Fisher's house as law enforcement and paramedics went in and out. My father had found his front door unlocked. He had been lying in a crumpled heap at the bottom of his basement stairs. It appears he had fallen and broken both of his legs, but it wasn't the fall that killed him. It was the rats. My father eventually told me that the coroner reported the man had been eaten alive while he was screaming for help, unable to climb back upstairs. He had defensive wounds all over his hands from swatting at them was about 20 years old when myself and three of my friends went back to the house in late October. The house had been repossessed by the bank at this point and now sat condemned. My family almost considered this vacant house our second home since it was so close to our property. My father would even do yard work every once in a while to make sure nothing was growing on the house. Like I said, my friends and I were drinking, smoking, and being belligerent idiots, just talking and lying about girls we slept with. I got up and went around the back of the house to take a piss. As I crouched down and glanced inside one of those low-to-the-ground basement windows, I scanned the basement floor. There was no evidence left of those events. All I could really see was a cracked cement floor and loads of cobwebs crisscrossing the window. I took care of business, and as I was about to walk back around to the front, I paused and glanced back toward the window. I almost felt like I was being examined. For a moment, I thought I saw the outline of an old bearded face and a single eye staring up at me, kind of at an angle, as if someone or something was peering up from the shadows below. The image was fleeting, and I quickly dismissed it as my imagination running wild. Still, an eerie feeling lingered as I rejoined my friends on the front porch. As the night wore on, the atmosphere around the old house grew increasingly unsettling. The wind whispered through the trees, and the air felt charged with an otherworldly energy. We laughed off our unease, attributing it to the alcohol and the spooky setting. Suddenly, a loud creak echoed from the front door of the abandoned house. We fell silent, staring at the entrance as it slowly swung open with a haunting groan. A cold breeze wafted out, carrying a musty scent that sent shivers down our spines. Against our better judgment, fueled by a mix of bravado and curiosity, we decided to enter the forsaken dwelling. Each step we took inside was met 
with the protesting groans of the dilapidated floorboards. The air inside was thick with dust, and the silence was oppressive. As we ventured deeper into the house, our flashlights revealed rooms frozen in time, covered in decay and neglect. The remnants of Mr. Fisher's life were scattered about, forgotten and undisturbed for years. We eventually reached the basement door, and an uneasy tension gripped the group. Hesitant, but driven by morbid curiosity, we opened the door, revealing the darkness below. The beam of our flashlights illuminated the same cracked cement floor and cobwebs. But this time, a cold breeze seemed to carry whispers of a distant, anguished scream. Our courage waned, and we hastily retreated from the basement, slamming the door shut behind us. The unsettling feeling persisted as we left the house. Now more convinced than ever that some lingering presence haunted the desolate halls. To this day, the memory of that night lingers, and I often wonder if the tormented spirit of Mr. Fisher still resides within those decaying walls, forever trapped in a macabre echo of the horrors he endured in solitude. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. As time passed, I tried to convince myself that it had just been a squatter or my imagination playing tricks on me. Yet that night, I had the most horrific nightmare. In the dream, I found myself trapped in a dark room, surrounded by rats crawling all over me, gnawing at my face as I lay there helpless. I woke up in the morning feeling sick. For a while, I wondered if maybe the man's spirit hadn't tried to confront me, questioning why I hadn't helped him or something. While I don't personally believe in the paranormal, it was a very strong and eerie experience. I never wandered back to the old man's property again. When I was about 10 years old, I remember being asleep in bed when I was suddenly awoken by eerie sounds outside my first floor window. It was summertime, so my window was wide open, and just the screen was between me and the outside. Suddenly, a flashlight shone into my room, starting on one side and moving over towards me. In that moment, I quickly hopped out of bed and scrambled right underneath the window so that whoever this was wouldn't see me. Thank God I managed it in time, and it didn't seem they had caught a glimpse of me at that exact moment. My golden retriever ran into my bedroom and started growling and barking at whoever was outside. The light went out immediately, and I heard multiple male voices talking nervously, followed by the sounds of them stumbling out of the bushes and running away. I couldn't sleep for about a week after that night. The incident left me with a lingering sense of vulnerability, and I became hyper-aware of my surroundings, especially during the night. As I grew older, these unsettling experiences became distant memories, but their impact on my psyche lingered. The old man's tragic fate and the mysterious encounter outside my window became fragments of my past that continued to shape my perception of the world around me. The horrors of that abandoned house and the haunting screams I once ignored served as a stark reminder that sometimes the darkest corners of our memories and the places we try to forget can resurface when we least expect them, leaving an indelible mark on our souls. In the stillness of my memories, those haunting experiences linger like shadows from a distant past. The abandoned house, the tragic fate of Mr. Fisher, and the mysterious encounter outside my window have become indelible imprints on the canvas of my life. As I reflect upon those eerie chapters, 
I recognize the profound impact they had on shaping my perception of the world, the guilt that accompanied my teenage indifference, the nightmares that followed, and the unsettling encounter in my childhood home marked a journey through the chilling corridors of fear and vulnerability. Yet, as time passed, these experiences transformed into lessons that transcend the ordinary boundaries of our understanding. Life's tapestry weaves together moments of light and darkness, and within those shadows, we find the threads of resilience and introspection. While I may never fully comprehend the enigma of that abandoned house or the depths of Mr. Fisher's despair, I carry the wisdom gained from confronting the unsettling and the unknown. In the end, these tales serve as cautionary whispers, urging me to remain vigilant in the face of life's uncertainties. The chilling echoes of the past have shaped me, not into a prisoner of fear, but rather a guardian of empathy and awareness. As I close the door on these haunting narratives, I step forward, acknowledging that the ghosts of our past can guide us toward a future illuminated by understanding, compassion, and the courage to face the shadows within and around us.